This law has been called the greatest generalization achieved by the human mind. The law is two bodies or bodies exert a force upon each other, which is inversely as the square of the distance between them and varies directly as the product of their mass. That a body reacts to a force by accelerating or by changing its velocity every second. And things would always stay still unless put into motion by some outside force. How fast things get going depends on the force behind them and how heavy they are. Sir Isaac Newton figured all that out a long time ago. So that leaves us free to see for ourselves what it all means. A body at rest remains at rest and a body in motion continues to move at constant velocity along a straight line unless acted upon by an external force. Nature uses only the longest threads to weave her patterns so that each small piece of her fabric reveals the organization of the entire tapestry. Our church has a mission statement. Our mission statement is sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. And so when you look at this and you see sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ, throughout this year we have been breaking this down, looking at some of the major words. The first word we looked at is the word sending. When you look at the word sending, a definition you can look at that is purposeful parting with a resource that you possess. Now for many of you that is a tongue twister and you say exactly what does that mean? Well, it means how you use the word send. Whenever there's some military action that takes place, you'll hear the news reports and they will say the president is sending troops into fill in the blank. And when those troops are being sent in, it is for a purpose, and that is to be able to help someone in need. In the story I like to tell, growing up, it seemed like that no matter what ailed you, it just seemed that the one thing that you needed that would cause you to be well was chicken noodle soup. And if someone could get you some chicken noodle soup inside of you, everything would be better and you would, you would feel fine. And so uh, there's always someone that's got that perfect chicken noodle soup recipe. And whenever they heard that a neighbor was sick, that woman would call and say, don't you worry about it. I am going to what? Send some soup over to you. Now, what that meant was that this particular woman, when she began to gather all the ingredients and go to the store and purchase them, she understood that these ingredients were not to be used for a product that would stay in her kitchen, but these would be ingredients that would be used for something that would be sent out to help someone else. When people join our church and become a, a member of Shades, they are sent. Immediately they're sent. Sent to go to your neighborhood. Sent back to their workplace. Sent to uh, their ball, the ball teams they're on or to the civic organizations that they serve in. And they are an ambassador for Christ. They are sent to give the good news of Jesus Christ. And so when we think about our church, it is sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. We are sent out and to tell the gospel. For some, it will be just in our everyday life. For some, it may mean that God gets a hold of your life and changes you. And you may be going across the seas and even on another continent. But we just know that we are sent. But it's talking, when we look at that, it says sending transformed people. Now, this last, um, uh, last five weeks, we talked about transformation. And when transformation is in the outward reality of an inward work. When something is transformed, it means that something was happening on the inside, and then we see the, re the results of it on the outside. It's an outward reality of an inward work. It's a metamorphosis that takes place. And what happens is when a person receives Christ as Savior, that the Holy Spirit comes into their life and begins to do a radical reorientation of their life. It's an inside job that God orchestrates it, and it's a continuous and it's a slow process of this transformation. But as we go through that process of transformation, God begins to change us. He changes our perception, He changes our priorities, and He changes our passions. 
to where now we want to seize this grander vision of being able to live for eternity and to have something that has significance in our life that will go all the way through eternity. That's what transformation is. Sometimes God uses trials to build that steadfastness and that perseverance, but through it all, he wants us to be changed individuals that go out. Now, lest you walk out of here and even in that five-part series and say, well, in order for me to be sent, I've got to be transformed, so I guess I've got to wait until I mature as a believer, then I can be sent. No, not at all. The day you ask Christ into your heart, you are sent out. Uh, perfect illustration in the Bible, there's a guy named Matthew. He was a tax collector. Jesus came by and said, hey, I want you to follow me. Packed up his, uh, his bags. He says, I'm following you. The next day, he has a party. It's called a big feast. And when he had this feast, he invited Jesus to come and he invited all his friends who knew nothing about Jesus and says, you need to meet this man right here. He was already sent and he'd only been a believer maybe for a few days. So we are called to be sent and we are called to be transformed. But then the last part of that mission statement, sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. What does it mean to influence someone? It is this, an effect of one person on another. It means to move a person to some action. When you influence one, it is an effect on one person on another. You influence me, and usually it is to move to some type of action. Now, the best way, I think, to explain that is what you saw in the video and what we have sitting here. And what this is called is Newton's Cradle, or for some of you, it is a time waster in your office. Uh, something that just gets you going when you uh, love to see this. Newton's Cradle is a device that demonstrates the conservation of momentum and energy. And I would love to, in just a few moments, explain the laws of physics with differential equations, however our time is limited. And so I hate that I'm not able to do that. So I will give you a layman's version as to what happens. When you take this sphere here, and as you lift it up, whenever you release this sphere, the force of this sphere hitting these stationary objects will then cause this last object to move. It goes something like this. Ah. And for hours, you can watch this, okay? So let's try that again. What it happens is I take this fear and I hit it like that, and all of a sudden, because of what action happened here, we see an action over there. Now, this visually shows you what happens when one object hits another object, but for, in terms of our message, it also is a picture of the power of influence. The power of influence of what it means when one person affects another person. And every one of us have influence. And we want to talk about this because in our mission statement it says, sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. I want you to turn your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. We will start in the 13th verse. But in this, in this passage, Paul is defending his ministry. He planted the church at Corinth. He's written some letters to this church. There are some vocal de uh, detractors of his. And so a part of this chapter is he's defending his ministry. However, at the same time, he is reminding them of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so in the midst of writing this, he comes to the close of this chapter in, in verse 13. And let's just walk through this. In verse 13, he says, but we will not boast beyond limits, but will boast only with regard to the area of influence God assigned to us to reach even to you. Now, as he's talking, they say, there's some things we can boast about in the work that we've done, but I wanna let you know that we will not boast beyond limits. We will boast only in regard to our area of influence. Now, the Bible, New Testament, is written in Greek. And, uh, and so you take a look and you say, what does that word mean in the original language? And the word influence is an interesting word. The origin of this word influence is a word that means a measuring rod, almost like a ruler. It's a measuring rod. And then you take it a little bit further, and it's a sphere of activity 
So if you put like a measuring rod in a sphere of activity, it, it would be like uh, if somebody lays down a plat of land and they begin to measure out different parcels of land. And they would end up saying, okay, this is your area of influence right here. This is what's been measured out for you. This is your sphere of activity. And so the Apostle Paul says here, we boast only in regard to the area of influence that God has assigned to us. His area of influence was evangelism and church planting right there in Corinth. And he says, I want to let you guys know that's all that we're boasting about. And then in verse 14, he says, for we are not overextending ourselves as though we did not teach you. We were the first to come all the way to you with the gospel of Christ. We were the first people to ever come to Corinth and to open up uh, the word and explain to you the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then he comes to verse 15. And again, we do not boast beyond limit in the labors of others. So we're not here bragging about what other people have done, but our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged. Now look at that verse, pretty close. Our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you may be greatly enlarged. As your faith increases, as you, the believers of Corinth, as your faith increases, our hope is that you will take the gospel and then share with others. And as it shares with others, then that area of influence will increase. The New Living Translation says it this way. We hope that your faith will grow so that the boundaries of our work among you will be extended. We hope that your faith will grow so that the boundaries of our work among you may be extended. You say, what does that mean? Let me illustrate it this way. All right, let, let's pretend this group right here Let's just say they were the church at Corinth, and I was their pastor, and uh, we had an opportunity to lead all you to Christ, and you're a part of the church. You've been coming every Sunday, and, and, and you're just hopefully growing some in the Lord. And what the Apostle Paul is saying is, guys, we're doing a great thing over here, and, I, and I'm really glad for what's happening uh, with this church, and this is my area of influence. But what I'd love for you all to do is to grow in your walk and in your faith with God and be able then to take your faith and carry it to this group of lost pagans that are right here, okay? This group here. And you chose to sit, sit here. You're, you're typecast, okay? So we got a, a group right here. And let's say these folks don't know Christ. They've not heard the message of Christ. And they live close to you, but they've not really heard the gospel or maybe they've heard parts of it. What I would like for you to do is for you to be able to begin to share with them. And as your faith increases, you begin to share with these. And guess what? Now all of a sudden, these people are coming to know Christ. Well, for me as the pastor, if I'm the Apostle Paul, my influence has just been enlarged. Because you see, I influenced you to know the gospel, but then guess what has happened? Because these people know the gospel, you can trace it back and say, hey, Paul, part of your influence is over here right now. Because these people are hearing the gospel because you shared with me and now I've got to share with them. But then look what he says in verse 16. And then Paul says, the reason I want you to do this is what? So that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. So what Paul's goal is, if I can get you fired up enough to share your faith with here, guess where I'm going? <clears throat> I'm going over here. Where these folks have never heard the gospel. I mean, it's never been over here. And no one's been here. And I don't want to go boast where someone else has been. I want to go where no one's been. I want to go to an unreached people group. And that's what this group is right here. And so Paul says, once you cover that, you freed me up to come over here and to share the gospel with these people. You have just expanded my sphere of influence. Does that make sense? That's what Paul is asking. And that's what he's asking of the church. And it's really the same thing that we would ask of our church. And so... We want to expand that influence. And then you come to verse 17 and 18. It says, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. For it is not the one who commends himself who's approved, but the one whom the Lord commends. Now, putting this together, I want to talk to you about influencing your world for Christ. I'm going to give you five things that every one of us needs to make a note, keep it in front of us, and think about our influence. Are you ready? Number one is this. There are five things to do, and number one is this, measure your influence. 
Measure your influence. I want you to turn back one book to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, we've got something going on here and that we're all on chapter 10s, but one's in 1 Corinthians, one's in 2. Now, I want you to look at 1 Corinthians, the first letter that Paul wrote. Now, before I read it, I want to let you know that in New Testament times, there was a group of people that were called the Stoics. And what the Stoics believed is that there was something called an appropriate act and something called a perfect act. Now, the difference between an appropriate act and a perfect act is that the perfect act understood the reason for doing it. Both would be good. Things that you did, they're good. It was appropriate to do this. But what sets it apart is that you understand the purpose and the reason for why you are doing it. Now look at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31. He says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever you do. Eat or drink, whatever you do, you do it to the glory of God. What he's saying is it's more than just doing good things, but my motivation is to glorify God and to ascribe praise to him. Whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God. So whenever I try to exert any influence or me impacting the life of someone else, it is not so that people will brag on me. It's not even so much because a need is met. The purpose is, is that we would be able to point to God and point to the goodness of God and to his son, Jesus Christ. And if exerting my influence, there's a need that is met, that's good, but still the purpose behind it is to point people to a loving, holy God. This changes your whole perspective. Because it's talking about if you're going to have an influence What that influence means is that I want to point people to God. Everything that you do, whether you eat, whether you drink, whatever you do, you do it for the glory of God. The goal is not for people to say that I'm a great neighbor. The goal is not for people to say I'm a great teammate. The goal is for people to say, wow, you serve a great God. And that's different. Because too often we would love to be able to do things for people and just say, hey, I want to do this for you. And that's good that we want to, but there has to be a deeper purpose, and that is I do this because of who God is and because I want to point you to God, and I want you to know of a loving, holy, merciful, gracious God who wants to enter into a relationship with you. Now look what he says, verse 32 and 33. In verse 32, he says, give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Just as I try to please everyone in everything I do, not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. Now, look at the very last part of that verse 33. I'm not seeking my own advantage, but that of many that they may be saved. What Paul is saying, bottom line, it's not about me, it's all about him. And everything I do is to point people to Jesus and to his glory. I've got to ask you, what good is your influence if you're just merely being altruistic? I'm just going to get out there and, and try to meet some social needs. It's good if you want to do that. But if you're not pointing people to Christ, then all you're doing is it making them more comfortable as they travel on a road that will lead them to hell, separated from God for eternity. If my purpose is not to point people to Jesus, and my point is not to do what Paul says, that many will be saved, then all I'm doing is just some good things to make people feel better, but in eternity, nothing has been changed. They're still lost in their sins, and they'll spend eternity separated from God. Influence is having an effect on another person, moving a person to some action. So church, for all of us, measure your influence 
and see whether your goal is to glorify God in all that you do. Measure your influence and see if your goal is to lead people to saving faith in Christ. Measure your influence and see if it is to help other believers to better see Jesus as they travel along their own spiritual journey. It all starts by us measuring influence. Sending transformed people to influence their world for Christ. When I'm thinking of influencing my effect on another person, is it to where they will be pointed to God? Is it so that I can help lead them to saving faith in Christ? Is it so that if it's another believer, I can help them to see Jesus in a fresher way as they travel on their spiritual journey? It changes your whole perspective. Now, you still do nice things for people. It would drive you to do even more nice things for people because I want to point more people to Christ and more people to God. Starts out by measure your influence. Number two is maximize your influence. You measure your influence. Do I have the right perspective? Next thing you need to do is maximize your influence. Verse 32. Give no offense to Jews or to Greeks or to the church of God. Give no offense. That word, no offense, means a stumbling block. Do not trip up others by being a stumbling block. Look at it closely. He says, I don't want to give any offense to Jews, Greeks, or the church of God. I don't want to give offense to those that are in the church or those outside of the church. I don't want to give offense to those that are like me and those that are not like me. I don't want to give offense to those who are socially, economically different than I am or those that are racially different than I am. I don't want to give offense to them. I don't want to be a stumbling block to them. And what he means by a stumbling block to them is that I want to be someone who's living for Christ and I don't want to be an offense or a stumbling block. I want to, no matter what they're, where they are in life, I want to point them to the gospel and I do not want my life to be a stumbling block that keeps them from seeing that. You all have influence. Every one of us has influence. It's not like you come today, when you walk out today, you say, hey, you got me a little influence. Yeah, you've got influence. Your choice is, how will that influence be used? See, you will either use your influence to help lead people to Christ and for people to see Christ, or you will use your influence to trip people up and to stumble to where they then live a life in opposition to Christ. You only got two options. You're either using your influence to, for people to see who Christ is and, and to live a life for him and you're drawing them towards that direction or the way that you're living your life, the words that you say, the actions that you have, the way that you live, you could be tripping up people and stumbling because they look at you and they say, well, now you're a Christian, but yet you can do this. You can say that. You can treat your spouse like that. You can treat your kids like that. You can treat your parents like that. You can go to those places. You can do those things. And then all of a sudden, people kind of get tripped up and they get stumbling and they say, well, gosh, I, I, I didn't realize that. I guess I can go that same way. And begin to move in opposition to the things of God. Listen, to maximize your influence, you need to live like Jesus and obey his word. To maximize your influence, you need to live like Jesus and obey his word. See, I want my influence to be one that would draw people to Christ and not take them from it. Now, I love to go to movies. I love to go to movies. And when you walk into a movie, when you go into a movie and you sit down in the theater, the very first thing that you see is the screen. You see the screen. And it's usually huge. And when you see that screen, you're just kind of staring at it, and then all of a sudden, the projector lights come on, and that light shines through that screen, and then you begin to see these beautiful, majestic images of a movie, and the movie's playing. And when you look at that, you're so wrapped up in the movie and wrapped up into the scenes that you don't really think too much about the screen, do you? And when the movie's over, and the lights are back up, and you're walking out of the theater, how many of you walk out of there and say, man, that was one cool screen? I love that screen. It's phenomenal. No, you'll probably comment about, wow, that was a big screen. Ah, you commented on that when you first walked in. What you do is you talk about, that was a great movie, 
great actors, great script, great producer. He didn't even talk about the movie. Because what it did was it, it, it influenced you. It, it did something there. It, it, began to, it began to speak to you. It, it created uh, some of the, these emotions within you. And, and it was all created because of what was on the screen. And sometimes it causes you to question some things or to think deeper. Or maybe it was just a time that it gave you encouragement. Or maybe it was a time that it gave you hope. Or sometimes it's even walked out and made you sad. But the one who produced that movie had a specific response that he or she wanted you to get. And because of that screen, he was able to do that. We live our lives as that screen. And God's movie is to shine through us as he shines that light through us. And as people see us, they should be able to see the message of Christ and it should be unhindered. Now I've been in movie theaters and I've been in a bunch and I've seen those screens up there, and it's great. But you know, I've also been in a movie theater. When I looked up and at the screen, there was like a tear in the screen. And then I've also seen where there have been some smudges on there. Have you ever seen that? Where it's just not, and there was one that had a, like a tear. I can't understand it, but it's like a line that was drawn down there. It bothered me the entire movie. I mean, they could have been playing Rudy, and it was still bothering me. I mean, it didn't matter what the movie was. But as I'm watching this movie, I keep looking over there, and I say, what's that old tear in there for? It's kind of driving me crazy. Or, or sometimes there's like a smudge in an older theater, and I'm saying, well, I wanted to see that, but I you know, just can't. Uh, so my favorite movie was when we moved to Ruston, and uh, this is off script, but it'll be okay. Uh, when we moved to, uh, to Ruston and uh, Louisiana, and they had one theater, and they had, um, uh, had two screens, and it was real old, and uh, newer movies came out with different um, pixels and dimensions and everything, and I'll never forget, we went to sit and uh, watch the movie Hunt for Red October, and I sat down with Janice, and it came up on the screen, and it says, Hunt for Red October. I said, oh, this is going to be a long movie <laughs> because they're going to put words down there that are not going to make it through the whole screen. And it bothered me. You see, a screen can really bother you. And if you're a screen with tears and smudges, sometimes it means that the message isn't communicated as clearly as it should be. Now, let me tell you this. Every one of us has tears and smudges in our lives. We're not going to live perfect lives. But our goal is to maximize our influence and by maximizing our influence, it is to try to clean up the tears and smudges as much as possible. For me to live like Jesus, to obey his words so that the motion picture that God is showing of his son's love and how Jesus died on the cross for our sins and how he's raised on the third day, conquering sin and death and how he offers us eternal life and purpose in life. We want that to be shown through our lives, okay? So the first thing you need to do is you need to measure. Measure your influence. Is it to, to give God all the glory? Maximize your influence. Live for Christ and obey him. Third is to mark out your sphere, your sphere of influence. Mark off your sphere of influence. I want you to go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. When I say mark off your sphere of influence, look what he says in, in verse 13. He says, but we will not boast beyond limits, but we'll boast only with regard to the area of influence that God has assigned to us. The area of influence that God has assigned to us. A definition of influence that I like is your sphere appointed by God. I just love that. Your sphere appointed by God. You need to mark off your sphere of influence. Today, you have a sphere of influence. Six months from now, it may be different. But right now, today, you have got a sphere of influence. It is the sphere that has been appointed by God. And I'd love you to do an exercise this week. Take out a, a notepad or maybe just type into your computer or your iPad or whatever it is and begin to identify your sphere of influence. Your home, your work, your school, the ball team, the dance ensemble, Maybe the men and women that you play bridge with, your travel companions, your supper club, your Facebook friends, truly Facebook friends, not the 10,000 that don't know you, but the true you know, Facebook friends, people 
that intersect with your life. And I would challenge you to do this and just begin to write it out. You know what you're going to realize? You're going to realize you have got a wider swath of influence that you ever imagined. I mean, you're going to be amazed. The number of people's lives that you intersect with, guess what? That is God's appointed sphere of influence for you. That's what you have. Now, it may change on down the road. It will. As life changes, that sphere will change. But for right now, you need to mark off your sphere of influence and say, okay, this is where God has me. So I want to measure it, want to maximize it, then I mark it off. Number four is this. You need to multiply your influence. Multiply your influence. Once you identify your sphere of influence, I say go wade into the waters and begin to have a particular purpose. Be directed in influencing lives for the gospel. And when you do that, you're going to see a multiplication take place. In uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 15, second part of that verse, he says this. But our hope is that as your faith increases, our area of influence among you will be greatly enlarged. He said, I want you to seize the grander vision of reaching people for Christ. I want you to see the grander vision of pouring your lives into other people as they're going in their spiritual journey to help them to understand what their purpose is in life and to help them to understand who Jesus is. I want you to be able to multiply your influence. And every time that you come into contact with someone and you come into contact with them and you've got the mindset of wanting to influence them for the gospel, what will happen is when their life is influenced, you have just multiplied your influence on there. Karen Aiken was a, was a lady that my wife and I would say that if you met her, your life would be enriched because of it. She is, uh, we knew her from Ruston. You've heard me talk about her that uh, conducted her funeral over a year ago. as uh, She uh, uh, finished her battle with cancer. And um, at her funeral, this story was shared. And I contacted this guy and asked him to write it out for me so I could get all the words just correct. He's a great guy. He was in our church when I was pastor there. And um, Karen Aiken was the director of admissions uh, at Louisiana Tech University. Jason was a student. Jason was from a very small town. And he loved music, but he was kind of scared about what was going to happen in his life. He just didn't have a whole lot of confidence. But he was outgoing. He was friendly. And uh, there was a program where you would adopt a student and uh, Karen and Hudson, her husband, they adopted him while he was at school, which means you get to come by, eat meals, and get your laundry done and all of that. And, and so they built this relationship uh, with Jason. And she knew that he could sing and that he loved to sing. And so what she did was she said, hey, there's an event, and I would like for you to go and to sing at this event. He said, okay. So he goes and he sings at the event. Well, the director of the Department of Theater at Louisiana Tech was there at that particular event. And they heard him sing. And this lady went over to Karen Aiken and she said, who is that? She said, that guy is great. We are getting ready to do the spring production of Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. And I need to find a lead man and I need to find a Joseph. And I think this guy would be perfect. So, they were going to contact Jason. Jason says, well, let me just give you the backstory on that. Earlier that year, I sang at an opera, and I made a decision that I don't want to be with those people anymore. <laughs> Theater people drive me crazy. And he says, I'm never going to do anything with that. There's just no way I'll ever do anything with that. So, Karen approaches him, and she said, hey, the director wants you to audition for Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. He says, no, I ain't going to do that. I don't want to do that. His roommate says, you need to audition. I'm not going to do that. He had friends that came up to him and says, you need to sing that. I'm not going to do that. I just don't want to do it. So he was adamant. There was no way he was going to do it. Everything was done on that. And when he wrote his story to me, he made a statement here that resonated with me. He says, however... Karen saw beyond what I could see. Karen saw beyond what I could see. And he continued the story. And that is that she knew that he should audition. And so she set some things up. She called the director. 
And she says, you need to call Jason and ask him yourself. He will be at my home doing laundry, so give him a call. <laughs> she calls the Aikens house. He answers the phone. It's a director of the theater. And she says, I'd like to ask you to come and be a part and to audition. He says, how did you get my number? I mean, how did you know I was here folding laundry? She said, Karen. And if any of y'all have ever watched Seinfeld, you know Newman. It was kind of like a Newman thing of Karen. Gosh, I can't believe she did that. Five times that woman asked him on the phone, and five times he said no. He said, no, 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 no. I am not going to do it. I don't want to do it. I will not do it. And just as they were getting ready to hang up, she says, oh, I understand that Karen's younger daughter, who's like about 10 years old, is also going to be in this play and that you have agreed to drive her to the audition. If you could, maybe just stick around and you might enjoy it. He hung up the phone and he did another Newman. Karen. Because what Karen had done is earlier she had said, we're going to be out. Can you take our daughter Aaron and take her to the audition? Because she said in the back of her mind she knew he was going to say no. So he said, I had a terrible attitude. So I had this terrible attitude. I grab Aaron. We drive over there. And as we drive over there, we take her in. The director says, oh, just stick around. Just watch it. He said, I stuck around, started watching. He says, this is a blast. This is pretty good. So then they call me up here and say, hey, why don't you just sing something? He says, I was prepared for nothing. So I sang the Star Spangled Banner. <laughs> he says, that's all I knew to sing. He says, so I sang the Star Spangled Banner. And at the end of the Star Spangled Banner, on the spot, they said, we want you to be the lead. And he agreed to be the lead for Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat. Now, he agreed to be the lead on that. But then he goes further. And this is what he wrote. He says, because I did this show, I ended up majoring in music. And I met my best friend, Jennifer, who years later became my wife. Karen knew it. She could see it before I could, and she made it happen for me. I know now that she was hearing and following the Spirit. And Jason, graduating from Louisiana Tech, decided to go into Christian music. And he went with a group called True Vibe, and now for the last 12 years, he's been the lead singer of 33 Miles, and his name is Jason Barton. And because of the songs that he has written and the places he's performed, hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of people have heard the gospel of Jesus Christ because one woman had influence in his life. His phrasing to me was this, an impact I may never see this side of eternity, all because someone believed in me, in my abilities, and most importantly, believed in a God who can do the impossible and I am forever grateful. Praise the Lord. Karen lived her life to where she measured her influence to say, wherever God puts me, that's my sphere of, of, of uh, influence. I will try to lead people to Christ. And then what she did was she maximized her influence because she understood where her influence was and she went and began to pour into someone and because she was maximizing her influence, because she was living for Christ and because she was trying to live a life that didn't have a tear in the screen or a smudge on the screen so that more people could see through her, God was able to speak to her through this young man and God's thing, saying, I've got something special for him. She saw that in him and because of God's leadership, she said, if whatever I gotta do, I've gotta at least get you to that audition and you can make that call as to whether it is true or not. And when he got there, his whole life was changed. And there's a multiplication of influence. And you can take a Karen Aiken over here and look over the legacy of her life, and you'll see a Jason Barton with hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people whose lives have been impacted with the gospel. And it all goes back because one person over here decided that it was important enough to pull back the sphere and see what kind of impact you could have. That's what I mean about multiplying influence. Last point is this, always be open to moving your sphere of influence. Always be open to moving your sphere of influence. Verse 16 says this, so that we may preach the gospel in lands beyond you without boasting of work already done in another's area of influence. He says, hey, 
you know what my deal is? I'm loving pastoring this church right here, but you know what I'd like to do? I'd like to go where no one else has gone before and share the gospel. And what this means is God may have something new for you, a new calling, a new city, a new continent, to where you say, God, I'm open for you to move my sphere of influence. There could be a new calling on your life. God may say, I want you to go to a new city to do my work there. God may even send you across the seas and say, there's a new continent I want you to go to and I want you to share the message or to use your skills in that area. But you need to always be open to moving your sphere of influence. Influence, an effect of one person on another. As we close this morning, I just want to ask you the question, who in your God-appointed sphere will you influence for Jesus Christ? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that when you call us and when we are saved, when we receive your Son and his Spirit comes into our heart, that it doesn't end there that you give us the privilege of telling other people about who you are. You give us the opportunity to be ambassadors for Christ. You give us that opportunity to be people of influence, to have an effect on one person and on another. I pray for every person that is here and those that are watching on live stream that we would take a few moments and really grasp the situation of how much influence we truly do have. And mark out that sphere of influence. Make the commitment to measure our influence, to know that we want to glorify God. And Lord, then as we do that, may we multiply it. May you lead us to people that we can just live life with them, walk with them, and then be so led by you that we say the things, we do the things according to your will that will cause an impact in their life for the kingdom of God. For it is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.